Okay, and we're recording. Welcome, everybody, to the CTSC webinar for February 26, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dobheide. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Smart Data Blockchain with Dr. Marat Kantarjolu, and he is uh, presenting with us, and we're very grateful for that. And he's also presenting on our uh, first Zoom webinar. And so uh, I just want to let everybody know we switched to Zoom, if you hadn't noticed already. And so if you want to ask questions, uh, you can click on the little chat icon, which will open your chat window, and uh, you can type in your questions there. So a, a few more things to note before we get started. First, this presentation is being recorded. And second, your, the participants' lines are muted, so please type questions. And uh, we also will take questions at the end of the pre presentation, but uh, Dr. Kantar Jolu uh, encourages you to ask questions during the presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And with that, I will put myself on mute and uh, let uh, Dr. Kantar Jolu take over the screen. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Uh, can can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Sorry, uh, I don't see the chat screen easily, so <laughs> I should have a way to open the chat. I guess. Okay. Okay. Now I open the chat on the side. Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning again. My name is Mart Kantar Jolo. Uh, I'm a professor of computer science at University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, this is uh, work we are doing under a funded NSF CICI grant, uh, joined with my student Aravind uh, Ramachandran. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, our work on trying to leverage smart contracts, blockchain for data provenance. Uh, since I don't know the background of people, so, so I will try to be self-contained and have all the background necessary, at least to understand the rough idea. So if some parts are a reputation for you, I'm sorry about it, but I want to be really self-contained. So first, uh, let me start with uh, what is data provenance? I know maybe some of you already are already familiar with this concept. Uh, but for many scientific process, uh, we are having now more and more complex interactions. So in many scenarios, we start with uh, some observations or data collected from different uh, records and so on. And these observations and this metadata goes into the models, whether it's computational model or whether it's data analytics. And some data is derived and you do visualization and uh, and check do pattern analysis or hypothesis testing. And you, this scientific framework is usually repeated many, many times until you reach the result that you are after. So data provenance is basically in this life cycle of data. We want to understand really who produced the data, who modified the data, what processes were involved to create this data, and how the changes are recorded so that we have the history of the uh, data. So from uh, one point of view, you may ask why this history is important, but increasingly uh, we see that this is needed for many, many different purposes. So one important uh, purpose, especially in scientific data, is that then you can answer questions such as who created the data, which process created, when, and what changed it, and how, uh, you could be able to use this information to understand uh, data quality. For example, uh, if you know a certain process may be malicious or vulnerable to an attack, then you can go back and look at which uh, data was produced by this process. And that way be the obvious location to look into malicious modifications. Of course, uh, if you know what and uh, how the data is changed and produced, this will allow you to automatically reproduce the results because you can redo the history or you can replay the history. Of course, uh, when you do data traceability and who is changing the data, that also increases trust. In medical scenarios, 
you may know who created the, the result and that can have important implications on the on the uh, trustworthiness of the data. So we wanted to really have this history for uh, quality, trustworthiness, and reproducibility. And uh, if you look at it, there is also a significant issue in scientific research. Uh, this is, uh, I forget why I got this picture, but uh, increasingly it takes uh, longer and longer to detect errors and sometimes fabrications in scientific reports. Uh, it takes months and months before people figure out something is wrong. This could be okay for some settings, but for important things like clinical trials, uh, the, the sooner the uh, people catch this kind of uh, issues, the better it will be. Of course, the question boils down, how can you securely do this and uh, figure out falsifications using data provenance uh, in a public setting? And of, uh, before I answer our solution to that question, in other words, how to reliably capture provenance information and verify that, uh, of course, now the, the first question is, what kind of provenance information uh, you would like to uh, represent and uh, capture? In our work, we went with a standard called open provenance model. For those who are not familiar with this model, is it tries to really uh, represent uh, all uh, actions that may generate the data. And it automatically creates a graph by itself. So in this graph, you would have different components. And here, for example, you are saying that this artifact, this data piece, for example, is used by this process. And this process created another artifact, which was actually derived from this artifact. So what is artifact? It, it can be different things, and I will give an example to you. But basically, you can also look at, uh, specify which rule is used in choosing this artifact. And uh, you can also represent the accounts or the uh, agents that triggered the processes. So this creates a graph that could be captured to represent uh, data provenance. So in this model, again, this is a standard uh, web standard. Uh, there, are, there are things like artifacts uh, that represents immutable objects. It could be data or other, uh, other things, but for our purposes, it's data. And you have processes, uh, which could be programs, code, piece of code, et cetera, that creates the artifacts. And you have agents uh, which are basically uh, controlling the processes and creates the, uh, the artifacts or creates the artifacts via processes. So in, in a sense, we have this uh, relationship between these three types of uh, objects in the OPM model. And uh, now the one important thing about the OPM model, it tries to capture what happened in the past by using this arrow of things. So it's, it's not about what you would expect. It's about what happened to the artifact, what happened to the data. And it has uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, links. So here, for example, an artifact is used by a process. An artifact was generated by a process. I don't know whether you can see my uh, board thing. Here on the left bottom, you are saying that a process was controlled by an agent, etc. So you have these kind of relationships. And if you see this in a simple example, you can just to figure out what we are capturing. Uh, here, assume you wanted to represent how a baking process had happened, and you want to represent it in the OPM model. Here we have a specific baking process that will produce the cake cake is an art artifact at this point. And as you see, we have spatial links to the uh, different other artifacts here, butter, eggs, sugar, etc. is an art ar artifact. And our cake was derived from them. So we captured that relationship. And we have the baking process that gets all these artifacts and created a uh, cake afterwards. So these are the inputs and these are the outputs and you represent this entire process as a, uh, a graph. 
And of course, you could add information like who baked the cake as well. So now we have this graph information that we can capture, hopefully, and we can use to answer questions like who baked the cake, what was in the cake, and if you have allergy to some certain ingredient, can we check whether that ingredient is in the cake, for example. So that this graph would be useful for answering uh, those type of questions. So now, of course, the question is, uh, how should we store this provenance information? Uh, important uh, uh, question is, of course, if the provenance information is not stored in a secure manner, a potential attacker uh, or some malicious user can modify the uh, records and then uh, we may lose our ability to track and answer these important questions like who changed the data, what has been changed in the data, etc. So, of course, so this means that we need a secure storage uh, or secure way to store the data. Here, I'm showing two examples of uh, ledgers that have been used in the past. The one is on the left is, I think, from Hammurabi, from Babylon Times. Uh, where they record, uh, you know, users uh, of uh, certain debt obligations in uh, tablets, and the right is uh, from uh, uh, old days where they record uh, the bank accounts. So if we have some kind of secure ledger, uh, uh, like in this setting, where we can keep this provenance information somehow in a, an immutable way, then we can go back and uh, answer our questions using that immutable logs. Of course, uh, we are in a digital world uh, and we cannot really do uh, the tablets, obviously. So, of course, the answer to this in, in the current setting is blockchain. And what is blockchain? Again, I know some of you are very well versed on this, and I think there was a talk about it, but just to be on the same page. You can think of a blockchain uh, if you forget about the Bitcoin and other implications or applications. Uh, you could think of it's basically a distributed digital ledger and where you can record transactions uh, in this distributed ledger. So it's in really a database and you can really add uh, records to this database uh, like in the old days when in the Babylon type of scenario, but in a digital setting without a trusted party. And this is what but Bitcoin is based on, uh, where you keep Bitcoin transactions actually on this distributed ledger, like a blockchain. And therefore, uh, it's uh, the, because the block that I will, I'm skipping the things like proof of work and other stuff, uh, but because of the way it's settled, uh, it will be it's extremely hard or almost impossible to tamper or revise the uh, blocks or logs written to this ledger. Of course, this is one piece of it, but uh, so it's good. So you can record something on blockchain uh, in, a, in such a way that it cannot be tampered with. But of course, uh, we can, we believe we can even do better. And this is, uh, this comes with Ethereum. Ethereum is also a, a public uh, blockchain-based distributed computing platform. And in addition to having this logging or ledger mechanism where we can store information, on Ethereum you can also have as a piece of program uh, uh, represented as something called Ethereum Virtual Machine, where you can in addition to data or blocks on ledger, you can now have a programs on ledger, ledgers. And these are called smart contracts, basically. It's, from our point of view, it's simply a program. And, but the nice application of that is, you can also have this programmable blockchain and also include payment to it. Uh, why payment could be useful? Maybe payments could uh, be used to incentivize truthful and correct behavior. And that's, that's something we will look into in a second on how we try to use the payment mechanism. So uh, what is this EVM mutual machine on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain? It's basically a twin complete uh, virtual machine where you can uh, write uh, any code, but this code is restricted because of security and privacy reasons. First of all, this code will be on the blockchain and everyone can see what 
the code. It's not maybe it's a bytecode level, but everyone can see it. So you cannot store anything sensitive inside this code because it could be popped and and, this, uh, and analyzed. And but the nice thing is that uh, this uh, EVM will be run by every node in the chain in the in the part of the Ethereum blockchain. And once the code is executed, the proof of work type of consensus mechanism ensure that the correct execution happened. So in other words, once the code is on the chain, it will be run by the chain. So smart contracts basically now allows you to have a code and data reside at a specific location on the blockchain where you can keep information. And furthermore, you can pass messages to them. So it's a program, so that program can get a message. And uh, of course, you can write it in uh, high-level languages, which is uh, one thing we are using is for called Solidity. Uh, that's the common way of doing it on Ethereum. And it will live on the chain as a bytecode. So uh, of course, the contract sometimes is a misnomer. It's not really a contract like in the maybe legal sense, but it's more like an autonomous agent that live inside the Ethereum execution environment or Ethereum blockchain. And uh, you can kind of activate a code by sending a message. So unless there's a message sent, the code uh, sits still there. And most important, at least from application point of view, compared to a web application, another thing is that it can have its own Ether balance. Ether is the currency used on, on Ethereum. And it can store some permanent information that uh, which we can use to source some provenance information. And uh, at the same time, it can send or receive payments. So you can have this code to send payments or receive payments. So now with this background, uh, our smart data system is really a platform that's been implemented on Ethereum blockchain where we can uh, securely store sensitive provenance information for even sensitive data sets. And using smart contracts, we could also provide some payment mechanisms and also punishment mechanisms for wrong behavior. So you can try to incentivize truthful uh, behavior uh, using uh, blockchain system. And we have an off-chain module, and I'll explain why we have off-chain module. Uh, but basically, if you recall, uh, smart contracts by themselves uh, are seeable and any information that's stored by the smart contract will be accessible by uh, anyone uh, on the blockchain. Uh, therefore, uh, it would uh, be, uh, you have to be careful on what you are storing on the chain. And the second important thing is that uh, Ethereum, of course, with the prices now, it's even, uh, much more expensive. Because running a smart contract uh, and storing data with the smart contract will cost something called gas. You can think of it's like a, there is a conversion between gas to ether. So there, therefore, you want to keep that part as small as possible uh, and as, uh, as little as possible in terms of data storage uh, so that you don't pay too much money. Furthermore, from privacy point of view, you cannot keep sensitive information. You have to use some crypto techniques to hide the sensitive information that you store on the chain. So with these constraints in mind, in other words, don't store too much data on the chain. Don't uh, limit the amount of computation you do on the smart contract because it costs you money. And uh, don't store anything sensitive uh, without strong crypto on the chain. We, we come up with this design. So the way this our framework works is, let's say we have a cloud storage. Again, the data, because of the limitations I just mentioned, the actual data where we track the provenance is not on the chain. It's off the chain. It could be in cloud or it could be on a private blockchain so that we keep the sensitive data uh, uh, away from the uh, publicly accessible uh, blockchain. So now one person, let's call this person initiator or data scientist or whoever is it, done something to create a provenance event. Of course, uh, here again, based on the cost, you can 
do multiple provenance events and then store in every snapshot or you can store each of them depending on the cost. So it creates some event that, that we want to, to keep and store it on the public blockchain. And in our scenario, uh, we, are, we have an off the chain, and I will go to the details of this uh, process where the, the participants, uh, for example, the initiator could be a drug company, the verifier and participant could be a, someone on the FDA, Federal Drug Administration, that can look at the changes down to the clinical trial scenario. So this, of course, here there is this verifier uh, process. This is a piece of code running off the chain that can verify the records. Once this change has happened, this code running on the initiator part will initiate the, a process saying, okay, please record this change to the, this version of our contract, uh, or sorry, our data. And of course, in order to verify whether the change is acceptable, uh, we have a simple voting process, which I will talk about it, where, oops, where uh, participants uh, would vote on the chain. So once that vote uh, is accepted, the record, the provenance record will be stored on the chain. Of course, there are a couple of questions. What are we storing on the chain? How the voting works? How the verification works, etc. So now I'll try to go over those aspects uh, in more detail. So of course, we, in order to capture the change, we have this smart contract. I, I try to explain. So it's basically we have a function and state, and the state would be where we will be keeping uh, our uh, provenance data inside the contract. And uh, it's really uh, called when uh, executed only when they are called. So we, ha we should have a mechanism that's uh, being calling them. In our setting, it was this uh, user who or the system that re starts to record changes and calls a smart contract. So our main thing is that we have an on-the-chain module. In other words, when I'm saying on-the-chain, it's a smart contract sitting on the Ethereum blockchain that can uh, allow you to track new documents. In this setting, we have a document and or a data artifact that we keep changes to the data artifact. And of course, we have simple mechanisms such as who can access to that data, who can uh, track the change, uh, who can uh, modify this data, et cetera. And it's also the smart contract is responsible for tracking the changes, in other words, keeping track of or storing the provenance information. So uh, of course now, uh, what do we change or what do we uh, store on the data? Uh, as I mentioned, we cannot store anything sensitive on the blockchain, on a public blockchain, because it's accessible by every node in the network. And for example, you can today go and become a Ethereum node and download all the smart contracts ever created. Smart contracts can disable and destroy that, distract themselves. Uh, so once it's distract, distracted, it's gone. But you can see all the uh, uh, smart contracts ever created and download their bytecode and you can poke those bytecode and do some analysis on it to see what's storing, et cetera. So therefore, we cannot really store anything sensitive. All we are storing is that we assume we have a unique document ID, and we store what's the current hash of the document ID, what's the previous hash. We have a link uh, which is in this cloud where this is uh, uh, happened. We have some kind of timestamp, and we also have an initiator address. Here, each participant who are accessing the contract would have an Ethereum address, basically. You can think of a unique identifier on the Ethereum. It's basically created from uh, your public chain, public key information. Uh, and then, of course, we want to, to keep now uh, the OPM. If you think about it, OPM is like a graphical model. Uh, and our goal was to really map everything so that it's, it's more compact, so we don't want to have any text. In our scenario, we really map everything to certain type of integers. Uh, in, a, in a triple format. So, you know, we have uh, some kind of address, a process, an artifact, and it has its hash. 
So we map everything to integers so we can pack the provenance information much more tightly. Text would be longer. And this uh, would uh, create uh, uh, more storage on, our, on the chain and it's, it's, it will be more costly. So in a sense, we still capture that graph and that will be the what's been recorded, but we just compress it basically so that it would, it would have less and less space. So now uh, we have this voting process. Uh, the voting process is basically to make sure that uh, the data, the change down to the data that's stored in the cloud uh, is according to the, to the pro, uh, specifications. For example, uh, I will talk about a drug trial use case. And drug trial uh, use case don't want someone to delete a patient from the data set. For example, patient may pass away during the drug trial. And if you remove such a patient, the drug success uh, may look higher. So your verification could be saying that, okay, no change down to the data should delete a record from the data, for example. That could be your requirement. Of course, you could hope want that requirement to be changed automatically on the smart contract. Uh, but the problem with that is then the smart contract needs to see the original data, which could be big, and this could be costly to run on the smart contract, and also the security issues, because everybody will see the data. Of course, you can sidestep some security issues using zero knowledge proof type of setting, but at least for big data, our, our experience, uh, we, we try some of the zero knowledge proof of, uh, aspects, uh, and it turns out to be slow uh, and costly for our use cases at least. So therefore, we opt out to check and verify this off the chain, and the results is reflected to the chain via voting process. So uh, what happens is that whenever a change is submitted to the contract, a voting period starts. And the voters, again, the voters could be like an FDA or some other uh, stakeholders or other scientists involved in the project, uh, and uh, runs this code off the chain that automatically checks the, uh, the validity of the change, okay? And then, uh, then the, the stakeholders will cast their votes. So we have multiple implementations. It could be like you can say that uh, among this many people, X percentage of the total uh, accepts or rejects with accepted. So you can do a different type of voting. If certain person that is rejected, it's rejected. Or if certain person is accepted, it's accepted. So you can uh, change uh, based on the setting. Here, where you could do, and that's one nice property of smart contract is, you could add payment to it. In other words, before a change is done, the initiator of the change can deposit a money. So in other words, you are saying that, like, here is the money I deposit with the smart contract. I believe what I've done is correct. And uh, if it's not correct, I'm willing to lose this uh, money. So in other words, there, there, there is this potential punishment mechanism uh, if, a person tries to initiate a, a wrong or malicious change. So that's one power of smart contracts, you know, which is that you can automatically add payments to the system in the provenance tracking system uh, so that you can punish a malicious behavior. Of course, here the main assumption would be is majority of the participants would be honest majority of the voting participants would be honest. If they are not, then of course all the bets are off. But now using this, we could have a payment mechanism where the initiator of the change would deposit uh, some um, money to the contract. And when the voting ended, if the change is accepted and found uh, consistent with the established rules, for example, in the case of uh, drug trials uh, established rule would be uh, that you don't delete any record, then you would, the initiator of the change will get the deposit back, for example. Of course, how you set up the deposit amounts, et cetera, is more of a game theoretical analysis, which we didn't, but our system have this payment capabilities uh, built in. So now, of course, the big important part is the off the chain 
uh, module uh, that uh, can really verify uh, the data. So uh, that's very application specific. In our setting, you can give that module to us and uh, we can do it. In our experiments, we, we created one using a framework, JavaScript framework called Meteor.js, so it can run on people's browsers, so you don't need to load anything. Uh, and this is really, uh, the, it can interact with the smart contract. Uh, so uh, there's JavaScript APIs for calling a term smart contract. So when you write your application with JavaScript, you can interact with them and you can um, go to the system. And you can also do something called event watchers. So you, the, on Ethereum, whenever some sort of message passing event happened, it creates some kind of event on the chain. You can catch them, such as a voting process started event, and you can uh, adjust and respond uh, to uh, those events. And of course, uh, you can uh, set up a timer and it will uh, stop the voting process or verification process. All of them is off the chain. So we are assuming that the uh, off the chain module can uh, see the data in its entirety uh, using some uh, secure cloud storage. So that way it can guarantee that modifications done to the data is uh, valid and uh, according to specification. Uh, of course, uh, in, in the settings we look at, you could automate the, this verification code. If it's not automatic, of course, it wouldn't be very useful because otherwise then a human needs to verify and, uh, each individual change down to data. Uh, so in our set, in our we look at a couple of scenarios uh, in our prototype uh, where almost always we automate this voting mechanism. Uh, so it's not a human looking at it per se, but a code running on your behalf on a trustworthy environment like your desktop, for example, to automatically verify the changes. So I will talk about one scenario we looked at, one use case scenario we looked at uh, to uh, test this framework. And it was motivated by clinical drug trials. And uh, our understanding is that, uh, of course, they're computer scientists, but our understanding is this is an important process where you really want to be sure about correct procedures are followed, such as uh, no patient is deleted uh, from the trial, no, uh, uh, and everybody follow the procedures. So here in our example, you would code those procedures as this off the chain verification code. And that would be, for example, shared with FDA, let's say so that everybody agreed on the protocol. Once the protocol started, uh, let's say you want to find uh, the dosage information, you can have different doctors in working on different settings, and you may want to track number of individuals every month for a certain number of months. For example, it can be one year, you can track 300 patients in five different locations. So you can, in, in this setting, we assume that we have uh, uh, X number of doctors who are changing these uh, to clinical trial database for total 300 patients. And we, we want to make sure that no patient is deleted uh, and they will be there. And of course, we want to make sure that uh, each dose information is which, within the limits of the uh, potential acceptable range. Of course, if a doctor created a fake user from the day one and changed its information uh, accordingly, we won't be able to catch this and uh, it will still be able to uh, fake some trials, but uh, it will prevent accidental changes to the records such as uh, abnormal dose or deleting a patient once that patient uh, is uh, starting the uh, drug trial. So those kind of uh, scenarios would be uh, avoided. So in our scenario, we assume we have simple records, something like this. We have unique patient IDs. We have, we keep some information 
such as dosage, disease type, and the side effects that it's being recorded per month. So this, this kind of information is recorded every month uh, for a given patient, and it's getting updated, including added, etc. cetera, uh, during the uh, drug trial. So we want to capture who each doctor is, changing that, how it's changing that, et cetera, the provenance information we mentioned. So if you look at how the work, things work, this is what happens to the data and how the individual things uh, uh, interacting with the code. Uh, just use means, as I mentioned, uh, each operation of a smart contract on the chain causes it to use a gas, uh, which is, uh, there is a conversion between gas to ether, basically. And ether was around, one ether was around $900, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, last week. I didn't check the recent numbers. Uh, so uh, you you want to, you don't want to spend too much gas because it's it's costs you money. Uh, we run these experiments by the way. Ethereum has a test network which is freeish, so you don't need to uh, pay any money. Uh, so this is uh, executed on Ethereum gas uh, Ethereum test network, uh, and uh, uh, here uh, it's very important that the gas use is limited. So what you are seeing is that what's happening during the uh, voting process. The gas usage means that uh, whenever the certain number of message received to the contract, how much contract is using gas. And once the contract ran out of gas, uh, then it will stop working. So this is a way to prevent infinite loops in the contract because eventually the contract will run out of a gas if it's keep doing something. So in our set, setting, this spikes is when the voting started. So this requires the uh, smart contract to, to start and do some certain computations. This is, you can think of transaction counts like the time happening. And when this happened, of course, we do much more computation and then other ones are most con almost consistent. And this is another voting phase started. So the spikes are, a voting phase starting point, and then that voting ended and a new voting finished. So it's the gas we are using for voting process. And remember, voting process is done whenever you record uh, a change, a change you can, to the document, basically. So overall, it, it shows you, uh, oops, so, sorry, it's overall voting process. If you add them up linear, all of them, cumulatively says like linear setting, I don't. Uh, I forgot the scope of it, but it's it's basically uh, very consistent with respect to how many people in it. Uh, we have a paper. I will share the link at the end that will appear in a conference soon, where uh, you can uh, see much more operations, how much they cost, and the total cost as well. Uh, so all of them will cost, at least at the time we were running, uh, we were cost a couple of dollars basically to record that change. Uh, uh, of course, uh, change log means we store this information in the permanent state of the uh, smart contract. If you recall, smart contract is basically code plus the data that it, we store on the chain. Of course, the more uh, data you use, the, the cost will increase. And this, this uh, happens basically whenever a transaction recorded the data at that point, uh, we have a spike uh, in terms of processing and storage cost. And then it, it stabilizes as other transactions uh, uh, happen. Uh, so this is the average number of gas you require to record per change. Uh, in our setting, remember, we keep the OPM changes to the smart contract. Uh, and then this is uh, the cumulative cost. Uh, this is not as linear as it's been seen uh, because of the, uh, some of these initial uh, storage time and uh, storage cost. Uh, but overall, uh, again, the total cost was very reasonable. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we, we have implemented this decentralized system for creating 
uh, immutable data provenance logs using OPM. Uh, and each uh, log is basically capturing the change or the provenance information we want to keep uh, on the blockchain. And we keep them in an encrypted format, but since it's on the blockchain, it's immutable. Uh, you can, it's, it's verifiable later on. And uh, encryption, we use also encryption and other access control techniques to make sure that only the, uh, only the people who has access authority uh, to, to send, see them. Uh, I, I passed that part a little bit, but even the hashes and all the records are encrypted with a shared key associated with the contract known by all these stakeholders. Uh, why? Because even the hash itself can reveal something sensitive. Uh, so we don't want to even keep the hash information of the data unencrypted. And uh, we implemented this in a real world kind of scenario. Again, there is no real uh, thing, it's a prototype. And uh, it seems to work in a reasonable time and cost. Of course, here we assume that you record a change per month type of setting, so you don't have too many changes because each change will cost you money to store on the blockchain. So there is, of course, room for uh, figuring out what's the, how much of the uh, changes you keep off the chain and maybe store some kind of uh, you know, hash to your other aggregated information on the chain because of cost reasons. And of course, while we are doing it, we also allowed uh, punishments using payments using the smart contract mechanism. And uh, our future work is to really uh, make this uh, and understand this off the chain verification and to see how much more we can do on the chain versus off the chain and these uh, cost uh, trade offs. So, uh, I forgot to put uh, thank you to NSF. I will do before I share the slides. This is funded by NSF. And thank you all for listening. Uh, I try to keep the presentation shorter so I would have ample of time for questions. So I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Um, while people are typing, I'm just gonna go over a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, Oh, we got a question already. Great. So um, can you share the link to the paper that you mentioned? Yes, I will share the paper, our paper. It will be appearing in ACM close by. I will send the paper a link. Uh, I will send it. I will share the slides. Okay. Uh, and also I will have a link to the paper and I'll just in case I'll send paper to as well. <laughs> so, so that is it okay if I send the paper to you as well so they can it's together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll be happy to, to archive both. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Florence, uh, if you're on our mailing list, just be on the lookout for that. Uh, another question, will the code be open source? Uh, yes, the smart contract uh, part and the others, yeah, we will, we will open source it. But the, the, the reason we, 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 were, we didn't open source till this point is, uh, you know, this was uh, written by students to have a prototype, so we need to clean up the code a little bit. But yes, it will be open source. Here's another question. Are you already working with the FDA or with IEEE Blockchain for Clinical Trials Forum? Uh, if not, I would like to invite you to join. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yes, actually, I, uh, I work with them. I was in their event in Florida, actually. Uh, I, didn't, I, I presented this as a poster, so I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm part of it. Uh, and I attended that uh, event. They had a one event uh, in uh, Florida two weeks ago, maybe. I was there. Okay. Uh, I just want to grab the screen real quick mm -hmm. while we'll let some more questions come in. Um, one second. Let's see. Share screen. Um, so uh, we have a survey that we would like those of you uh, who, are, who are still here to take. Uh, so let me just plop this URL in our chat. Uh, 
please take this survey, uh, those of you who are watching, and I'll include it uh, in the email communications after this presentation. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear from uh, people requesting to present or maybe suggestions for future presentations and what you thought of our presentation this month. And also, uh, I just want to mention that our next webinar is going to be March 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. And uh, we're continuing with our data provenance theme. Our topic is data provenance for, for mobile devices with Leon Resnick. Uh, so please, uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, it's getting obviously a lot of attention nowadays. So please uh, follow uh, our, I'll be communicating a, a registration link uh, about two weeks before the, before the webinar occurs. Um, and with that, that's the only stuff I wanted to talk about. So. Anybody in the audience, do you guys have any more questions? Or, uh, go ahead, doctor. Yeah, so I was just going to say that uh, they can send me email if they don't have anything at, at this point, but uh, they can also send me an email later on if needed. Okay, I, if you're happy with me including your email address in the, yeah, okay, I will do that. Okay, I, I guess there's no more further questions. I, I think that's it. So uh, everybody who's attending, I want to thank you for uh, watching this presentation. Dr. Kantar Jolu, I want to thank you for presenting. And uh, Thanks for just, inviting. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just everybody be on the lookout. I'll be uh, archiving these slides and uh, posting a link to the video to share. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will send the slides in 10 minutes or so. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.